as a friend, and then we see them being close with another person, that we become jealous. This is the normal thing in the material world. But in the spiritual world, the devotees don't become jealous. They become overjoyed, full of love. Uh, there's no need to be envious, uh, because after all, there's enough Krishna for everybody. <laughs> Krishna is unlimited. So all the devotees are very, very satisfied in their service uh, to Krishna. And they don't need to be uh, jealous or envious. They, they don't need to um, try to play tricks on each other or... Uh, get into conflict of, you know, I'm a better devotee than you are, or I'm closer to Krishna, Krishna loves me more than you, or, I mean, this is just nonsense, this is all material. Uh, these things are material because they involve a feeling of scarcity. There isn't enough world, love to go around in the material world. Huh? This is a fact of life here in the material world. Everyone is feeling deprived. Everyone is feeling lonely. Everyone is feeling estranged from their real uh, state of joy, their natural state of happiness. They don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, they're just wandering around this material world, trying this and trying that. And then they, they make uh, commitments. And the idea of making the commitment is that they think they're going to get happiness. They think they're going to get love. But instead, they're simply cheated. Huh? Anytime that we make a commitment or we offer love or service to someone other than Krishna, huh? or other than in Krishna consciousness, I should say, uh, then it never works out. Uh, it, may, it may give us a little happiness temporarily for some time, but that happiness is not very good quality, and it's also temporary. So in this material world, we're always feeling unhappy. We're always feeling some pinch of uh, the qualities of the material energy, because the soul is spiritual. And when we come in contact with the material energy, it doesn't feel very good. Uh, we, we want something similar to ourselves because we're spiritual, but because the body is material, anything we contact through the body is also material. So unless we ex completely engage our body in Krishna's service, it's always giving us some discomfort and some pain. Uh, and then the, the different the psychological functions are also the same way. Because when the mind is in touch with the material energy, it becomes covered over by the qualities of the material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And this is a very unsatisfying, very, um, how can I say, almost like, well, poisonous to the spirit soul. Uh, the spirit soul wants pure consciousness, pure love, ecstasy, insight, uh, pure intelligence. But we don't get that. We don't find that here in the material world unless we're engaged in Krishna's service. Then we find it. So we have to have the discrimination not to get involved in any activities which are not directly related to Krishna. Then we can be happy even in this material world. Uh, even though there's so many crazy things going on, we can be like floating above it, not touched. Just the, the description is that the lotus leaf even though it is in the water, it never becomes wet, it never becomes saturated, uh, because the lotus leaf is coated with a kind of waxy substance that repels the water. So similarly, the soul, when in Krishna consciousness, is protected from the influence of the material modes of nature, even in the material world. So speaking of which, the final topic is special days for remembering Krishna. <laughs> we just experienced that. It was very, very nice. There are many statements about the festive days in connection with Krishna's different activities. One of these festive days is Janmashtami, the day of Krishna's birth. This Janmashtami day is the most opulent festival day for the devotees, and it is still observed with great pomp in every Hindu house in India. 
Sometimes even the devotees of other religious groups take advantage of this auspicious day and enjoy the performance of the ceremony of Janmashtami. Ecstatic love for Krishna is also aroused on these days of Ikadashi, and which are other festive days in connection with Krishna. We already discussed Ikadashi, and we just had our Janmashtami festival. So uh, I hope you all are watching the videos. We're still working on getting all those videos uploaded. Boy, whew, there's hours and hours and hours of video. So we're still working on that. Now, let's see. Are there any questions or should I go on to the next chapter? What do you think? No questions? <laughs> no questions. Okay. Chapter 27. Now we're going to go from the Vibhava to the Anubhava. Anubhava is called subsequent ecstasy. When the devotee is uh, influenced by the Vibhava, the impetus for ecstasy, huh? then he begins to uh, perform service to Sri Krishna, he begins to glorify the Lord or hear about his transcendental pastimes or some kind of devotional service of the nine different kinds. So when, um, so this next uh, chapter is called Symptoms of Ecstatic Love. The bodily symptoms manifested by a devotee in, ex in expressing ecstatic love for Krishna are called anubhava. Anubhava means subsequent ecstasy. Subsequent to what? Subsequent to the impetus. Okay, the vibhava is the impetus. Then subsequently, these ecstatic symptoms are observed. Practical examples of anubhava are dancing, rolling on the ground, singing very loudly, stretching of the body, crying loudly, Hare Krishna, <laughs> yawning, there's a lot of that during Japa period. <laughs> Breathing very heavily. Neglecting the presence of others. Drooling. Laughing like a madman. Wheeling the head and belching. Especially after prasadam. <laughs> when there is an extraordinary excess of ecstatic love, with all of these bodily symptoms manifested, one feels relieved transcendentally. These symptoms are divided into two parts. One is called shita, and the other is called kshepana. Shita means shining, huh? and kshepana means blazing. <laughs> So when there is yawning, the symptoms are called chitta, and when there is dancing, they are called kshepana, ribol, <laughs> blazing love for Krishna. Dancing. While watching the rasa dance performed by Lord Krishna and the gopis, Lord Shiva beheld the beautiful face of Krishna and immediately began to dance and beat upon his small dindim drum. When Lord Shiva was dancing in ecstasy, his eldest son, Ganesh, joined him. Uh, the dindim drum is a, a little two-headed drum, and it's like on a stick. And you shake the stick like this, and there are these two like beads on a wire or on a string. And they, they turn, and they hit the drum. So it goes takara, 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 like that. Funny little drum. Rolling on the ground. In the third canto, first chapter, verse 32 of Sri Bhagavatam, Vidura inquires from Uddhava, 
my dear friend, is a Krura in an auspicious condition. Not only is he a learned scholar and sinless, but he is also a devotee of Lord Krishna. He has such ecstatic love for Krishna that I have seen him rolling upon Krishna's footprints in the dust as if bereft of all sense. Similarly, one gopi gave a message to Krishna that Radharani, because of her separation from him and because of her enchantment with the aroma of his flower garlands, was rolling on the ground, thereby bruising her soft body. Singing loudly. One gopi informed Krishna that when Srimati Radharani was singing about his glories, she enchanted all of her friends in such a way that they became stone-like and dull. At the same time, 